Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining in. I am Tony, the Geeky Agent from Remax here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, specifically in Binbrook. I am just chilling here this afternoon in between piles of paperwork and other things that I'm doing and checking out the awesome weather that we're having today in Binbrook. It is not super hot. It's probably still under 20 degrees Celsius, but it is a beautiful, bright, clear day. Uh, no rain so far and everything like that. So it's an awesome day to get out and enjoy the sunshine and all that sort of stuff. We are going to be talking about a couple of things today. I'm just going to give everybody a chance to join in. I'm going to get myself organized here and I hope you're doing amazingly well. Uh, it is Tuesday, June 26th. Summer has begun. The real estate market here in Hamilton is pretty busy overall. Not quite as crazy nuts as it was last year, but it is still pretty steady and busy. And depending on the neighborhood you are in, you are still looking at competing for properties that are well-priced and that show well and all that other kind of stuff. Same as normal. That's pretty much the normal way real estate works here in Canada, pretty much, and pretty much everywhere else. If your house is priced properly, it shows well, it's easy for people to imagine themselves living there, then they wanna buy it. And not just one person, many people. So that's kind of the way that works. And we're just going to get started here. So what we're going to be talking about today is the hold back clause. Now, most people probably don't have a clue as to what exactly a hold back clause is. I'm going to give you my fancy little presentation here. The hold back clause. Dun, dun, dun. So we're going to be looking at the hold back clause, what it is, how it's used, how it protects buyers and sellers, actually, depending on how you want to think about it, I guess. And... Mm hmm what I do need to tell you before that though is this little disclaimer right here the opinions expressed are my own and no one else's just so you in case you were wondering it does they don't belong to Remax even though I work for Remax they are my own they're not Aria or Korea or the Hamilton Burlington board or Facebook or YouTube or wherever else you're watching this in any of the known or unknown universes in any point in time past present or future so all these things that are coming out of my mouth they are mine and on top of that, for one extra little bit of fun, I'm not a lawyer, in case you were wondering. I am a real estate agent, specifically a realtor with Remax here in Hamilton. Uh, I am a member of the Hamilton Burlington Real Estate Board, the Realtors Association of Hamilton Burlington, the Ontario Real Estate Association, and the Canadian Real Estate Association. And in none of those titles does it say anything about me or I, or however the grammar goes, being a lawyer. So, just in case you're wondering, if you do need legal advice regarding a holdback clause, including a holdback clause in an offer that you're submitting, please discuss with your realtor or myself if I am your realtor. And if you really, really have serious questions about it, we can always refer you to legal counsel to help clarify any questions that you might have. So that's that. That's just the, uh, the cover my butt section of this little chat. So what is a holdback clause? Most people are familiar with all the different clauses that go into the purchase of a home. So you can have a condition in the, in the agreement for a home inspection, or there is a financing condition so that you can make sure that you get the mortgage that you need for the amount of money that you need before you finalize the purchase of the home. There are a number of other different conditions and clauses that can be included. A agreement of purchase and sale, the contract that we use to make an offer and submit an offer and negotiate, is a legal document. You are negotiating a contract between two people. So as you can imagine, there's all kinds of conditions and clauses that could be inserted in there depending on the circumstances. So if you're in a room rural property or farm property, you may have a septic system, so there might be a condition in there to have the septic system inspected. If you're on well water, you want to get the water tested to make sure it's drinkable, that there's enough water pressure and all that sort of stuff. One of the things you can put into a agreement is a holdback clause. So when do you use a holdback clause? So that's a good question. So let's get started with that and we'll get into the nuts and bolts of this whole thing. So a holdback clause is something like this. So if you've got a, if you've gone through to purchase a home and you've had a home inspection, you may have found something wrong with the house. So a home inspector goes through the property and uh, discovers that there's mold in the attic or that there some of the joists have been cut because people were moving wires around and or something that needs repair. Windows might be broken, they don't open and close properly, there might be some plumbing issues. So you don't necessarily cancel the deal, but you do negotiate with the seller. You might be able to get them to agree to fix that problem before you take possession. Or you might be able to negotiate a change in the price, etc. 
So basically, if you negotiate a repair, this is a clause that's often used in an amendment. So they pull out an amendment and that an amendment is something that's added to the agreement of purchase and sale. It changes the existing terms. And what you do is you insert, you're putting in a new clause. And what's most commonly used by a lot of agents is like the following listed there. The seller agrees that the seller's sole liability and expense to repair slash replace, whatever the case might be, the insert item name here. So it could be furnace, it could be window, whatever it is. By no later than, and I've just put in here as an example, five business days prior to the agreed upon completion date. So the closing date of the transaction for this agreement of purchase and sale. Now that's a perfectly fine condition to include. Uh, it outlines that the seller is going to agrees to take care of the repair, whatever. And it could be a list of repairs. It could be a whole bunch of different things. You just have to itemize them all. And that they intend to do that by no later than five days before the closing date. So if you've saved one of your walkthroughs, hopefully your agents have scheduled a couple of walkthroughs for you, um, you can use one of those to kind of check those things out and make sure that they were done properly. However, the problem arises when, uh, you know, you might also, you know, you want to make sure that the seller does this properly. So you, the problem would arise is like the seller doing it themselves. Um, and if it's something very, like, serious and requires a, a permit or a contractor like a furnace or something like that sometimes you can add this also this following clause so in addition to the first one where the seller agrees to conduct the repair you add this and saying seller agrees to provide proof of the repair replacement by submitting of a copy of the certified contractor receipts to the buyer or buyer's representative by such date as or aforementioned before above which would be five days prior to closing these, these clauses be can become much more complicated. The ones that I use are much more detailed than this. This is just sort of as an example of something someone might use. So just in case you're wondering, they can become very long and very specific about what needs to be done and what kind of proof you provide, how long the contractor should have been in business, etc., etc. So these are just examples of that. But the question becomes, so now you've got the seller to agree to do the repair, but what happens if they don't? The offer is no longer conditional at this point. So you've got a firm sale and you've got a seller that agrees to conduct a certain repair. And if it comes to the end of the line and they don't, then what? Can you cancel the transaction? Can you demand that they do it? All that sort of stuff. Really, you don't. I mean, you, now you're getting yourself into sort of a legal battle because it's not really spelled out in that amendment or anywhere else in the agreement of purchase and the sale to tell you what happens if someone doesn't fulfill their, their obligations. Ultimately, you could claim that it's a breach of contract, that the seller didn't fulfill their obligations and refused to close. But then at that point, you don't get that house anymore. If it's a house that you really wanted, that might not be the best option for you. Ultimately, you can take possession of the house and then go back with a lawyer and try to sue the seller for not fulfilling their obligations and saying like, look, you said you were going to do it by a certain, certain day. Now I have to do it. It's going to cost me all this money and aggravation and hire a lawyer basically to sue them or take them to small claims court if it's a smaller claim. There is a better way. <laughs> so what happens, that's in the absence of a holdback clause. So there's no holdback clause been used there. What you can do is you can include a holdback clause. So if you are watching here, the first part of this is a... Uh, uh, what was already there, the part in black. And what we've added was the part in green. And that is potentially the, the language for the holdback where it says, should the seller not complete the agreed to repair replacement, the buyer's lawyer is hereby authorized to hold back X number of dollars for, from the agreed to purchase price to be awarded to the buyer as credit on completion. So if you're looking at uh, replacing a window, and you know that replacing the window, you go out, you can, you know, before you make this deal, you can go out and see that replacing the window is going to cost $500 plus another $250 for a contractor to come in and actually install the window for you. You could put the $750 there saying that, you know, if the seller, even after agreeing to purchase, to complete the repair, doesn't do so, we are going to hold back $750. So if you agreed to a purchase price, of uh, $100,000, 
the seller in the end would get 99250 and then you as the buyer would get the $750, which usually is applied as a credit. You normally don't get cash back. You normally get like whatever the lawyer's fees might be in your land transfer tax. You get that $750 applied as a credit against that so you don't have to pay that. That's technically or usually how it works out. But basically, when you include this clause, this holdback provision in there, now there is no question. Everyone understands what's going to happen. So in the first part, you've agreed to uh, complete a repair. So the sellers agreed to repair an item or have it replaced. And then it, there is no question. It's like, so if, if they don't, then the lawyer holds back $750. If they do complete the repair, there's no issues. If they, if they fulfill their obligations by the time specified, um, then the lawyer doesn't hold anything back and all they have to do is provide proof of completion as indicated in the clause, the uh, receipts from the contractor, etc. And everything is good. You can also put in that a, a, notifi a notice of fulfillment is needed or something along those lines if you want to make it a little bit more uh, detailed or complicated. Uh, but basically that's what a holdback clause does. Um, so then <laughs> the question becomes what other times can you use a holdback clause? So it comes. What comes up is, hey Ken, Ken's here, Sean Morrison here, Paul Chima's in, John Odie. Thanks for joining in, dudes. Um, what other times can you use a holdback clause? Well, we live here in Canada, here in Hamilton specifically, in an area that experiences all four seasons. We get snow. We get uh, in the winter. We get spring, summer. We get fall. And if you are purchasing a home in the winter, and the home has a pool or it has an air conditioning unit. There's really no way to inspect those items in the middle of January when there's like 12 inches of snow on the ground. Um, so though the pool has been closed up at the end of the summer, hopefully done properly, uh, the, the air conditioner is not in use and there is no technician that will test an air conditioner once the temperature drops below a certain point. I think it's even at like 12 degrees or 13 degrees Celsius. Um, so you can't, you can inspect the home but you can inspect the air conditioner to see if it works. You can inspect the pool. So you can put in a holdback clause at that point uh, because basically you haven't had the opportunity to inspect those items. So the holdback clause actually, instead of going in an amendment, goes in the actual offer to purchase in the agreements of purchase and sale in Schedule A as, a, uh, as one of the clauses in Schedule A. So if we go back here, what we can see Here's a pretty basic holdback clause that we use in the case of a pool in my brokerage. So this is a standard clause that we've created, our lawyers in-house created for us at Remax Escarpment. And this is what we use. It says the seller agrees that the buyer's lawyer may hold back X dollars from the purchase price in an interest-bearing account until a certain date. So if you're purchasing the pool in January here in Hamilton, or purchasing the house, not the pool, sorry, um, Usually by the end of April into May, you get to the point where the weather is good enough that people can open up their pool. So they can call a pool company or they can go about doing it themselves. They can remove the pool cover, uh, turn on the pumps and the heaters and all that kind of stuff and test it. Check out the pool liner to make sure there's no cracks or tears in the pool liner, all that sort of stuff. So usually that date that you would put in there would be something like May 31st. So we're buying the house in January and we have until May 31st where we're going to hold back a certain amount of money. And that amount of money is negotiable. It could be $500, could be $2,000. Depends on whatever you negotiate with the seller. If, you're, if you've got a really old pool and the, sell, and the seller's not really sure what kind of condition it's in, you might want to hold back a larger amount of money in case the pool liner needs to be replaced, which is a very big job or anything like that. If the, if the seller... Uh, has some documentation that they had a pool company come in every year and open and close the pool and it's well maintained. You might want to hold back a smaller amount of money. Just again, whatever you feel comfortable with and whatever you can negotiate between the buyer and the seller and the agents involved and sort of come together to some sort of an agreement. What if the clause continues and says, prior to the date last mentioned, which would be May 31st, as I said, the buyer shall advise the seller of any deficiencies associated with the pool and the seller shall be given a reasonable amount of time to remedy the same. So we're kind of bringing it back to the position where it was when we we're doing the home inspection. We're negotiating with the seller and we're saying, look, we want until May 31st to make sure that the pool or the air conditioner or whatever the item might be is in working order, is in good condition. If we happen to find out 
when we open up the pool that there is a problem, that there's a tear in the liner or the pool equipment's not working to some extent or whatever it might be, I'm going to give you, the seller, a chance to repair that, uh, that deficiency because it might be cheaper for the seller to repair it as compared to the amount of money that we held back. So if we ended up holding back $2,000 because we thought the pool liner might be torn or something, and it's actually a much smaller issue, what we can do is allow the seller to remedy that so the, the seller can hire a contractor or whatever it might be and get it remedied ultimately. Or you could change that to say something along the lines of, of the money that's been held back of that $2,000, you will use whatever is required to conduct the repair. So the buyer will go ahead and hire a contractor and use some of that money to repair the item with the balance of the money going back to the seller. Furthermore, in this particular clause, the last part of it says, if the seller chooses not to remedy the deficiency, so if the buyer approaches the seller and says, look, you know, there's a tear in the liner, the, the pump for the, for, for the pool isn't working, the compressor coil in the air conditioner doesn't work, um, nothing works, we need to get it repaired, the seller might say, you know what, I just don't want to even deal with it at this point. It's been a couple months since I sold you the house. You have my $2,000 being held there. Just keep, or 500 or whatever it might be, just keep that money and we're good. And you use that money to do the repair. If there's any extra, it's all yours for the aggravation or whatever, it's all yours. And it says there that if the seller does chooses not to remedy the deficiency, he may notify the buyer as such and the buyer may retain the money as liquidated damages and the buyer shall have no further recourse with regard to such deficiencies. So at that point, the seller takes the money and if it was $2,000 that was negotiated, that's what they get. If the repair costs $2,500, well then they, they gotta be out of pocket for that extra, 20, that extra $500. Uh, that's what liquidated damages means and no further claims, no further recourse or no further claims. So this is like a pretty standard clause that we use in the brokerage to cover off against those type of issues. And there's my dog zero for no other reason other than the fact that I really like my dog. And there he is. So that's what the difference between using a holdback clause and not using one uh, does. Uh, using the holdback clause essentially just outlines the steps going forward should something not occur or if we need to investigate something further rather than leaving it open to chance. I've had situations where I've had the agents for other, for other people, for sellers, uh, say that they refuse to deal with a holdback clause. And basically, if there's a problem, we're all good people. We're all nice and friendly. We'll just work it out. That never works. <laughs> when everybody's nice and friendly, when there are no problems, as soon as a problem arises is when people decide to turn nasty or to be angry and argue and all that sort of stuff, which is why it makes a heck of a lot of sense to have a clause like this in place, whether it's in the initial offer or in the amendment while you're dealing with the home inspection clause or whatever it might be, to outline all the steps. So we're working in good faith. If the seller agrees to repair something, we are going to work in good faith and, and presume that he means or he or she means that they're actually going to go ahead and complete the repair. But we're also going to outline what happens should the seller maybe get sick and isn't able to complete the repair or runs out of time, gets too busy doing other things, or if they actually decide that it's just too much work for them and they don't want to complete the repair, we have it in writing what's going to happen in that scenario. And generally speaking, it's the hold back of funds. Uh, you can, as I said, make it more complicated so the lawyer will hold it back. And closing, the buyer will then hire a contractor, the lawyer will pay the contractor, and any money left over gets sent to the seller and all this other kind of stuff. So it can be as complicated or as simple as you want it to be, or as is you are able to negotiate with the, the seller of the property or the buyer of the property. So I'm gonna stop talking because I'm just sort of repeating myself. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. In case you are wondering, I am Tony the Geeky Agent, and this is Remax Geek TV, or at least my version of it. If you are looking for me online, you can find me at Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. That's where the majority of my content is. But I am also on Snapchat, Twitter, Tumblr, and Pinterest as well. If you are wanting to look, find me offline, you can at 289 23 9896 or email me tony at thegeekyagent.com. I'm always up for a chat. And if you want to find my website, I'm at thegeekyagent.com, of course, and hamiltonlifestylesearch.com, which will take you to the search portion of thegeekyagent.com. And thegeekyagent.com contains 
Tons of videos, including most of these ones, tools for buyers and sellers, mortgage calculators, insurance calculators, a whole bunch of things, searching for housing and all that sort of stuff. And it's going to be updated soon. So keep an eye out for that. We'll have a whole bunch of new features for you there to make finding a finding and or selling a home in Hamilton that much easier for you all. So again, thank you for joining. I love you all. I truly do. If you're watching on YouTube, have a look around for the subscribe button. It's around here somewhere so you don't miss any future episodes. And until next time, I hope you have an awesome day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.